Hi everybody, this is Paxton Gray. Today we're gonna to talk about content, how you can change your content and perspective on content to provide better results for your business and a better experience for your customers. We're gonna go over an intro, thinking about content from a different perspective, how you can use three different elements to gather data to improve your content. So I come from 97th Floor, I'm the CEO of 97th Floor. We're a digital marketing agency that specializes in SEO, content, advertising, and design. And what I'm gonna share with you are the things that we've learned. These are some awards that we've won for the work that we've done. Uh, our, our culture is, is fantastic. We have 100 employees. Uh, we've learned a lot of things over the years. And more specifically, this, these are the kind of brands we work on. We work with big, large, uh, content-producing, direct-to-consumer, B2B companies in tech, finance. Uh, so we've learned a lot over the past 15 years about content. We've made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot of lessons. And I hope that I can share a lot of those lessons with you today so that you can improve your content quickly. So this article was written uh, a while ago by Mark Schaefer. It talks about content shock. And uh, his whole idea here is that there's so much content in the world that it's impossible for anybody to focus on all of it. There's just too much data for us to, to gather and consume. So uh, it becomes harder and harder to do content marketing because it gets more and more crowded. And because it's harder, it's almost not worth doing at a certain point. Well, I hope the people at Content Marketing World don't believe that because uh, I don't believe that. Uh, and uh, here's why I don't believe it. This article was written in 1902 and you'll see it says, books slay us. We have too many of them. There are too many kinds, right? This was written in 1924. Uh, 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 too many books written, too few of them to read. Uh, this was written in 1992. There are too many channels. I mean, how many channels were there in 1992? Maybe there were like 50 or 100 even. Uh, but now what are we dealing with? But back then they felt like it was just too much. And this was written in 2019. There are just too many podcasts and not enough time. So I think, in fact, if I go back one slide, the feeling that we have as consumers of there being too much is not new. That's something we've always felt and has always been, frankly, just a part of human existence. So I don't think that that should inform our decision to invest in content or not. I actually think that there's not enough when these people say there are too many podcasts, too many books, too many shows, I actually think what they're saying without realizing it or what they're feeling without realizing it is that there's not enough. There's not enough good podcasts. There's not enough good shows. There aren't enough good books that are worth reading and it becomes hard to sort through all of the chaff and the things that are just not worth our time to find the golden nuggets. Think about how many times you've gone back and watched The Office again, right? We watch it over and over and over again. I mean, there are people that have watched that whole series, you know, dozens uh, of times. Why? Well, because it's good. And they forego watching a bunch of new stuff that is eh, mediocre. And there's good, uh, good stuff to, to watch, but largely there's not that many good shows on. And we live in a world where we are able to fracture our media to really speak to an audience. Uh, and, and I think that's true for our content as well. Content Marketing Institute, they did a study a while ago about people in the industry and what we perceived as the biggest problems uh, as marketers. And the number one response to that survey was that we don't have enough time. 69% said not enough time. We, the number two response was we're not able to produce enough content. And as you can see, the third response was we're not able to produce content as engaging, 47%. So I wanna know why. Why those three and why in that order? And I think I have a, a theory and idea for this. So in every organization, you've got the boss, right? And the boss is the CEO, the boss is the CMO, or maybe this is the boss is you, and this is like an internal discussion, but you've got the boss, you've got the marketer, the boss just says, give me viral content. You know the dress from a few years ago? Give me that. Like, give me something that people just go nuts for. That's what we want. Or our competitors had something to go that went viral. We want that. And, and you know, the marketer's just like, uh, okay, well, what does that even mean, really? You know? Uh, and this is kind of a, a funny time to be talking about viral and viruses. Do you really want to compare your content to a virus? What we're talking about when we talk about our content going viral is we're focused entirely on how it spreads. It spreads exponentially. And without saying it directly, when we talk about our content going viral, that means that we are inherently focused on what we get out of the content. Do you think a virus cares about the people it infects? No, not at all. It just is focused on spreading and reproducing, almost against the will of the host or the recipient. 
So why would we want to compare our content to something that cares, in fact, doesn't care at all, or in fact harms the recipient? What we should be focused on when we create content is the user, the recipient, and what we can do through our content to make their lives better and make them happy to share something because they want to. So trying to create viral content, we start, we start working. We, we start writing our blog posts, filming our video, designing our infographic, whatever. And, and we all do this, I do this, I still do this. We Right before we hit publish, we hit submit, we say a, a little prayer to, to the marketing gods. We say, dear marketing gods, please let this go viral. And we send our baby off into the universe. And because we're thinking about ourselves and what we get out of this content, not enough about the market and how they think and what, how they're gonna react to this, we miss. We miss more often than we hit. And because we miss, we respond by just creating more content over and over, videos, white papers, infographics, blog posts. Uh, it just is endless, the amount of content that we're producing as an as a, as a, a industry as a whole. And because of that, only 60 to 70 percent of con or 60 percent uh, 60 to 70 percent of content that we create goes totally unused. It just sits on a server somewhere, never to be seen by a human. That like Think about all the work that goes into producing that content for it to never be seen by anybody. Like, what a shame. And because of that, only 9% of marketers strongly agree that their marketing is working. That's, that's really rough. So I think the reason we listed these three as our top three concerns is actually because of number three here. It's because we're not able to produce content that engages. Because if we could produce content that engages, we wouldn't have to spend as much uh, uh, time time, right, uh, uh, producing that content, and we wouldn't have to produce as much of it, which is our number two concern. So really, it's almost the problem that we listed this as our number three concern rather than our number one concern, which really it should be, is producing content that actually engages our audience. And it's crazy that only half of us responded uh, as that as our primary concern. So how do we create content that engages? I think about, uh, uh, obviously, the brain is not divided uh, in terms of like there's a creative and, and an analytical, like we know that, right? But uh, it's still like ourselves, we're kind of divided in that way. We have an analytical side to ourselves and we have a creative side. And sometimes they work together, sometimes they're in conflict. But in the content production process, I like to think about the marketer as this, you know, half of a half analytical, half creative person. If we only engage the analytical side of ourselves, which we do sometimes, uh, uh, that, that produces content that frankly just doesn't, is, it, it's very hard to get content like that to resonate, right? That content is often seen as either really boring, really stale, uh, or it, you, know, you can get really manipulative content if you're just focused on the data and there's no heart to it. However, if you only rely on the creative side of yourself and ignore the data and don't use the analytical side of yourself, then that produces content uh, uh, like th what I call the Michael Jordan effect. So years ago at Nice Floor, we had a, an intern program. We still do, but we had a different type of internship program back then. We hired 14 interns and we, we gave them all a room and we said, hey, your job interns is just to give us the coolest ideas you can come up with. Here are the clients and we just want you to brainstorm, come up with awesome ideas and we'll take something and, and we'll run with it. Uh, they, they huddled together for, for a few weeks and they came to us and they said, okay, here's our big idea. And it was this one intern that was a representative and he said, what we need to do, it's for a client that sells office furniture and we're going to get Michael Jordan and we're going to get a picture of him. He's going to be jumping over a bunch of office furniture piled up and it's going to be on a billboard. And it's not just going to be any billboard, it's going to be a billboard that goes over the freeway and we're going to put that billboard right next to where I live. So. Who do you think that intern was thinking about when he came up with this idea? Number one, do you have any idea, like Michael Jordan wouldn't do that for any amount of money, but if he did, do you have any idea how much he would charge? And if we somehow got him to do that, we can't put a billboard over the freeway, that's not legal. And if we could do that, if we somehow got Michael Jordan and the government to collide and we had the budget for it, you're going to put one billboard up, just one, and where are you going to put that? by your house, like this, 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 uh, and I don't really blame this intern, I, you know, this is our fault for setting up this system like this, but he was focused on himself. And I think we still do the same thing as marketers, maybe to a lesser degree. He wasn't thinking about the market. Who, who are the consumers uh, of this office furniture? 
who do they, do they like Michael Jordan? Where do they live? Will, are billboards the best way to reach them? We should be thinking about them and almost take everything that we like and we think and, and, and how we respond to things and just throw that out the window because we are not the market. So what we need to do is use our analytical side of our brain to gather information, gather information specifically on our market, how they think, how they act. This is, this is the, the traditional research stuff that we were taught in, in school and in, in marketing, right? Uh, gather as much of that information as possible, but then we need to activate the creative side of ourselves to crunch that information and turn it into a creative solution that will speak to our audience in the way that they want to be spoken to. And, that, and, and so if you feel like you're not a creative person, that, that you have a hard time coming up with these really awesome campaigns, the answer is not that you're not a creative person. The answer is you just don't have enough data. If you get enough data coming in, your brain will chew on that data and produce creative results. So if you're not having creative ideas, just figure out how to gather more data. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this presentation. David Ogilvy has a good quote on this. He says that big ideas come from the unconscious, but your unconscious has to be well informed or your idea is going to be irrelevant, like the Michael Jordan idea. So stuff your conscious mind with information, but then unhook your rational thought process. Let your brain do what it does really well, which is naturally chew on the information that it receives. Whenever we have a gut feeling, what that is is our brains have been gathering all this information and suddenly made a connection without us even trying or forcing it to happen. We just had an aha moment or an idea happen or a gut feeling that this is the correct decision, but we don't know exactly why. It's because our brains are, are data gathering machines. We just need to feed it and then let it come up with the creative solutions. So there's this un unconscious part of our brains, right? The question is, how do we learn what the world is telling us? The beautiful thing is that, uh, and I love this presentation style because I can go all the way around the globe here. The world is giving us more information than we've ever had. When I went to school, the only way to get information was to conduct focus groups and surveys and, and, and do statistical analysis and that. And those are still good things. But enter the world of social media and, and analytics, and we can get access to so much more information probably better information, frankly, than focus groups and surveys. The question is though, how do we tap into that? How do we allow that data to enter our minds almost like avatar, right? And, and that data becomes part of our brains. And, and uh, th this, this to me is the biggest thing that marketers do wrong. We think that our understanding of the world is complete. We know how everyone thinks. We know how people will respond, right? You'll, I mean, look at the last election. Did anyone predict that on either side? No. It's because we, we, we are so bad at, think, at understanding what other people are thinking. So we need to use data to expand our sphere of understanding, expand our, our perception of what is happening in the world, and then our brains will get to work on that wider view and come up with really awesome solutions that plug in where there are gaps. So how do we gather that data? I'm going to give you three ways to gather some data. There's hundreds. There's hundreds of ways to gather data that's really important for your marketing. But I'm going to give you three cool ones uh, that you can use today, as well as some giveaways and tool suggestions that you can use right now. Uh, and they're, they're pretty uh, inexpensive tools. So this first one is search data. It applies to SEO and PPC, obviously that's search. But people often don't realize that this applies to market research or product development, right? Or building your website. Getting search data is so important for that. So Google gets over 1 trillion queries a year, still, 1 trillion. And of those, 15% have never been typed before in the history of mankind. 15% of 1 trillion every single year. What that means is keyword research is never going to die. This is a never-ending well of information. There are always new things that people are typing into Google and asking for, so that means there's always a good reason to go back to the well and do keyword research over and over and over again to mine that new information. So how do you do it? Really, really high level, this is how you do it, and then I'm gonna give you very, very tactical. So high level first. Number one, you need to pull data on thousands of keywords, and I'm talking tens of thousands of keywords. If you're not doing tens of thousands, maybe 100,000, you're not doing it correctly. Pull tons of data. And what data? Well, obviously you need the keyword, but you need volume, how often that keyword is searched for each month on average over the past 12 months. Suggested bid, if you're gonna bid on this keyword, uh, how much should you bid? The higher that bid is, that means it's more competitive. There are other people willing to bid high for that. Why is that important for us? Well, it shows us 
we can assume that the higher the bid, the higher the ROI people are seeing. Because if they don't see a good ROI, at least for an extended period of time, they're not going to be willing to bid that much. So we can assume that the higher the bid, about, you know, that, that's higher quality traffic. It's not always true, but it's kind of the best we got for a quick analysis. And the last is difficulty score. Tons of different tools you can use for this. It doesn't really matter what you use. Uh, basically, the higher the number, the more difficult that keyword is to rank for. This allows us to find holes in the market where no big competitors providing really good answers to these questions or to th these queries. Uh, we're going to aim for those holes. We want high volume, high suggested bid, low difficulty. That's the, like the magic combination. Uh, and then all we need to do is find those holes in the market, group them by intent. What is that person searching for? That goes to one landing page or that goes to, that becomes our next product, that becomes our next infographic or video or podcast or whatever you want to create, right? That, that's basically a group of things a ton of people are asking for that no one's really giving them, which is a huge opportunity for marketers to give that to them, earn that attention, earn those conversions. And yeah, the common theme, there's your next piece of content. So that's the process, really high level. Now let's get super tactical. So here's what it looks like in execution. Uh, SpyFu, great tool for this. I love SpyFu mainly, I mean, it's super cheap and it's really fast. It kind of does what it's supposed to do really fast. Uh, so go to SpyFu, uh, you just click on SEO keywords uh, and it brings you here. So let's pretend for uh, this uh, example that we are the marketing team for Acorns. So if you don't know Acorns, they're a micro investing. You invest spare change, they invest in mutual funds. It's an app. Uh, so we're going to take Acorns, we're going to plug them into SpyFu. We're going to click go, basically, and get everything that Spy or that Acorns ranks for, along with bid, volume, and difficulty. So that gives us everything they rank for. Tons of keywords already. We're going to export that, save that as a CSV, and I'm just going to set it aside for a second. Now I'm going to go to Betterment. I'm going to go to Stash, I'm going to go to Robinhood, all their competitors potentially, and I'm going to plug them into SpyFu, see everything they're ranking for, export all of those and save them as CSVs, and I'm going to set them aside. So now I've got four CSVs of my keywords and all my competitors' keywords, uh, and I'm not done yet. A lot of people will stop there. Uh, the next thing you need to do is go to publishers that talk specifically about what you do. So don't go to Forbes if you're Acorns. Go to things like Mr. Money Mustache or The Penny Hoarder, right? They're about micro kind of investing and small finance. They're not big financial investors aren't reading these blogs, but the kind of people who use Acorns are reading these blogs. So the reason that's important is because these publishers rank for thousands of keywords that your competitors have never heard of before. And so this is going to give you an edge. The competitors, that will allow you to find areas where you can compete with them head to head because they're already ranking for it. But the publishers allow you to go around your competitors and rank for things they don't even know exist. So then you're going to take all these CSVs, you're going to smash them together, you're going to remove duplicates. This is what it looks like and it should be tens of thousands of rows long. Now how in the world are you going to sort through all this data quickly? Uh, so uh, I built a template and all you need to do is take all your data you, you plug it straight into the template and it will get to work. It takes a second to run, but it will color code every cell based off of how it compares to the rest of the cells in that column. Basically, green means good, red means bad. So now all you have to do is look for the keywords that are green in every column, which means that they're in the top 70% uh, uh, for each, each of the metrics. Uh, and uh, if you look in this, this uh, row right here, all you need to do is sort and everything that has a one in it means it's green on every, every column. So now you can take 40,000 keywords, plug it all in here, just sort by column I, uh, uh, J, and it will bring everything with a one to the top. Now all you need to do at this point is select which keywords are relevant to you and to your market, and boom, you're done. You've, you've managed to sort through and find the best opportunities in a huge array of keywords, and that's going to accelerate your, your ad campaigns, it's going to accelerate your, your content production, your SEO, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'd love to give this template to you. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn a lot, so connect with me on LinkedIn. Just search for Paxton Gray. I'm, I'm probably the only one you'll find there. Uh, and then just uh, connect with me and send me a message and say, hey, I'd love access to that keyword research template. I'll give you a link where you can go download it. Uh, I'll also give you a link to a longer webinar that shows you step by step how to use it because uh, it can get a little bit complicated. Uh, here's, here's a little case study of what this looks like. So Blendtec, their company produces blenders, right? 
Uh, most people know them because of Will It Blend, uh, but there's some limitations to this campaign. Primarily, it's not impossible, it's really hard for them to capture leads on YouTube. Every time they start to do something that's more commercial, their subscri subscribers start to go down. Uh, and, and the audience is limited. Like, uh, these guys blend up a bunch of stuff in blenders, which is really cool, but who do you think is in the market for that kind of video? Really, it's like a lot of teenage boys. They want to see a bunch of stuff destroyed in blenders, and it's awesome. It is cool. But they're not in the market for a $350 blender. This actually came out when I was in my early 20s, so I was like, yeah, that is awesome. And am I ready to buy a $350 blender? No. But now I'm in my mid-30s. It's like, yeah, now I'm in the market. So great campaign if you're willing to play the long game, but that's a long, long game. So they came to us to find the uh, different ways of targeting their target consumer. And we did this exact same method of keyword research that I just showed you, exactly the same. And we found this big group of keywords that were all about Buffalo Wild Wings and how to make their sauces at home. Because that's the reason people go to the Buffalo Wild Wings, right? It's the sauces. That's, that's what they like about it. Uh, and so tons of volume here, very, very low difficulty. And so what we did is we created a piece on how to make all the different sauces at home. Uh, and and uh, we published it on their site. Uh, we had some calls to action to get them into an email nurture system. Uh, and because the volume on these were so great and because the, the competition was so low, they started ranking almost instantly for all of these keywords. Uh, in fact, it ranks number one for 66 keywords on the first page for 1600, and that's about 30,000 to 50,000 page views a month. Uh, and, so, and that's zero promotion, no promotion whatsoever. Uh, and so it's all about finding those holes in the market and giving people what they're actually asking for. The people who are consuming this think, oh, great, this is awesome, this is what I wanted. Uh, and they're more likely to sign up now for future recipes and things from Blendtec so that when they're ready to buy a blender, they think Blendtec first. The next tactic I'm going to talk about is called semantic analysis. So what this is, is uh, we, we are trying to replicate how a search engine understands the internet so that we can learn from that about content and how we can create a content to be more friendly, not just to the algorithm, but to humans. So the algorithm will look through, sort through tons and tons of pages of information, right? And it just reads it like a computer does. Uh, uh, we, and it, it sorts all of these uh, articles or, or pages or whatever based off of some query from the user and delivers those to the user. So the question is, what happens here in the middle? Well, when Google visits a page, they start counting all the words, right? And, and they do that again and again. And they develop kind of a corpus of documents. They, they start to understand, uh, uh, you know, a, a normal document looks like this. And so they compare a document to the corpus. And they can see, well, this document, the way it compares to our corpus of documents, it's different in these ways. And that means this document is about this. In a really simple way, that's kind of what's happening here. So it starts to understand for a particular document, what are the more important words and phrases unique to that document compared to others? And with enough of that information, it starts to understand topics that that document covers and how comprehensive that document is. Well, if I'm Google, the, my ideal scenario is that someone searches for something, clicks, and finds exactly what they were finding. That's a good user experience for Google, which means the user is more likely to come back. And so if I'm Google, I'm going to be more likely to favor a an article that is more comprehensive, not longer necessarily, but more comprehensive on a given topic than another is that, that it's not, that's less comprehensive. And so what we need to figure out is how do we make our article more comprehensive? And we compare that, we can learn what we're missing in terms of topics. We're not talking about word count here. We're not talking about, oh, you need to say the word X three times and the word Y four times. It's more just an understanding what topics are we missing for this, for it to be more complete. And if we do that, we've seen it time and time again, rankings go up, but even more better, it's, it's better for users. Uh, here's uh, what you can use to, to analyze this. Write is a, is a cool tool for this. We actually built our own in-house software to do this, but Write is what we used before that, and I'd recommend using them. Uh, so with Write, uh, you click on content success, you add in the keyword you want to rank for, it will go and analyze the SERP and figure out which words are more important and which words are less important for this particular topic. Which words are more important and which words are less important for a given topic. And so what we can do is figure out how our content compares to that. So here's a little case study. If we wanted to rank for uses for coconut oil, uh, we would go to the, the SERP and see what Google has chosen as the best articles on that subject. 
and we can go through and count all of the words and see where we're missing according to what Google has chosen to be the most authoritative. And in Write, you can do that. You just click your, take your URL, you compare it against the set, and it will show you how you compare. Uh, now, what's interesting about this, we, we, we did this, and this is a real life case study. Um, we noticed that the most important word according to what Google had chosen to rank was yeast, and then number four was infections, and then infection. And we are the green dot. We're talking tons about coconut and lauric and, and, and other things that you would think are attached to uh, coconut oil, but we totally, we didn't talk about yeast infections at all. And the reason that this is so important to me, and I know this is kind of a, perhaps a, an awkward subject for some, uh, this piece was written by some guy in his 30s, and he's not thinking much about yeast infections and when he's trying to create a topic or a piece of content that's complete around coconut oil. But this analysis showed us that we missed a topic. And yeah, if we add that, that's better for SEO and that will help us rank higher. That's true, and we want it for those reasons. But this also allows us to make content that is more complete for the user. If, if someone is interested in that element of use for coconut oil and we just skip it, that forces them to go back to Google and find some, some other answer to that question. Uh, instead of us providing the, the, the complete uh, analysis of uses for coconut oil. So uh, uh, here's the piece. We, we added those, those missing uh, words and phrases and, and topics uh, and rankings followed. In fact, this is the piece right here. So they were getting pretty great traffic, uh, uh, but we added those missing topics here and within two weeks almost doubled our organic traffic. Uh, and then here's another piece to show that it works on brand new pieces as well. Uh, this is a kale smoothie uh, article, uh, and we, we did the uh, semantic analysis changes here, and we almost tripled our traffic within, again, two weeks. So it's very, very fast, instant results. Uh, but it's, it's kind of some work to get to the place where you understand completely what are your missing topics on a given subject. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's good for SEO as we see here, but I think what's more important than that is that it's good for users. It helps you create content that's gonna answer their questions. Uh, we, we worked with a, a big client in the finance space who uh, they didn't really understand or believe this. And uh, so we said, well, let's do a, uh, let's do a bake off. They had an entire kind of magazine style production team. Uh, we had our kind of gritty uh, on, on boots on the ground kind of people who were doing the keyword research and semantic analysis. And we said, you produce seven pieces, we'll produce seven pieces, we'll put them live at the same dates, and uh, we won't do any promotion of them. Let's see. Let's see how they do. Uh, pages that were written with the keyword research and semantic analysis data ranked for five times more keywords and earned 12 times more organic traffic within one month than the control group. Uh, and the best piece that we wrote within one month was ranking for 141 keywords. The best in the other group was ranking for 36. And what's really interesting is we then promoted both sets with equal links, and we saw that those promoted in the, ar the articles promoted with links uh, that were written with the keyword research and semantic analysis process uh, improved by 400% in terms of their organic traffic, and the control group saw no increase in performance. Uh, so uh, that's a, a really great way. Those are two great ways so far to gather data on how your, how your audience is thinking. This last one I call the human algorithm. It's, it gets a little more, uh, it's a little less science-y and a little more heart, uh, but some really cool tools I have in this one as well. Um, so I love algorithms and I love board games really because I love algorithms. I love seeing a set of rules and learning how I can use those rules to my advantage. And that's really what SEO is. Uh, Google's an algorithm, Bing's an algorithm, but social media, those are just algorithms too. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, they're just big, complex, if this, then that statements. And it's cool to see how they, they interact with each other, but what's really cool is to see how the human algorithm interacts with these other algorithms. So, you know, we can have a big discussion about agency and free will and all that, but I think to some degree, we're walking if this, then that statements, and we're not even aware that we are, right? Um, and to show this, you know, BuzzFeed has figured out a little piece of the human algorithm, right? BuzzFeed comes knocking, it's your pal BuzzFeed, right? We know what they want. We've got important things to do, don't waste our time. And they say, you'll, you'll never believe why this blue pill is banned in 36 states and we just go, ah, oh, like, 
I know this is clickbait, BuzzFeed. I know you're gonna waste my time, but why only 36 states? What does that pill do, right? We're so curious. There's like this algorithm built in our brain that when there's a little piece of new information, we can't help ourselves. We just have to learn, right? We resist. And then TMZ comes along and says, do you remember this child actor? What is he up to now? Uh, uh, this is from the Sandlot, kid from the Sandlot, obviously, right? Uh, I, when I built this, I picked this image and then I put it in there and I thought, what is he up to now? I, I gotta know. And I looked, he looks the same. Like if you saw him on the street, you'd be like, oh, you're the kid from Sandlot. Like he's just adult, that kid. Uh, but what's funny about this is I built this own slide. I, I built the slide myself and I couldn't resist myself. I, like I, I had to know what he was up to now. And I wasted 15 minutes while I was supposed to be building this deck, figuring out what he's up to now. That's how powerful this algorithm in our brains is. And we resist TMZ and then YouTube says, hey, watch this soldier come home to his daughter. And we're just like, ah, got 30 seconds. That's touching, I gotta see that, right? Fine, five minutes, I'll spend no longer. Three hours later, right? This, this is powerful, powerful magic. And the, the fact is, in marketing, there's a whole slew of just like slimy, gross marketers who view their job entirely as just to manipulate people and get them to do things they don't wanna do. And frankly, they probably have a better understanding of the human brain than many of the marketers who want to resist doing quote unquote bad things. I don't think it's bad to understand how the human brain works and to use that, but it's bad if you get people to do things they don't wanna do. What we need to do is to understand how the human brain works and to get them to do things that they want to do, to help them have a better experience. How do we use the dopamine cycle to get people to exercise more? How do we use kind of uh, our, our brain's ability to, to be attracted to new, new things to get people to be better parents or better community members, to get them to vote and do things, right? That's what we should be asking ourselves. So I don't mean to understand the entire human brain, right? I, I, I know just as much as you do, but here's, here's how you can better understand it one way, right? So let's pretend for this example that we are the Betterment marketing team. And I say to you guys, all right guys, we, we gotta create a bunch of content for Betterment, go. Like, let's create some good content. Uh, think about what you would create. Many people would say like, let's do 401k stuff, let's do tax stuff, let's do IRA stuff, great. So here's a cool tool, follower wonk. It analyzes Twitter bios. In fact, there's a better tool um, that I would recommend now called Spark Toro. Look into it. It's similar but better. Uh, anyway, follower wonk. It's it's also a great tool. It's really cheap. You add in a, uh, a, a, a Twitter handle, and it will analyze all their followers, a bunch of information about their followers, and you can see it here. You can see where they live, when they tweet, what kinds of things they tweet, which is cool. This is my favorite part. This takes all the bio information that they put on their Twitter bios and puts it into a big word cloud. And what do we see here? These are the people that follow Betterment. They're fans of Betterment. We see love, husband, father, husband, father, sports fan, California and New York. Now that we know this information about Betterment's audience, what kind of content would you create now? Magic Johnson, right? He uh, uh, is worth $400 million. A-Rod, you know, he, like we've got East Coast, we've got West Coast, tons of money. What do these guys do with all their wealth? How do they manage their portfolio? Imagine if Betterment got a little bit of time and sat down with them and said, tell us about your investing strategy. Heck, why don't they go to Shaq? Shaq's a better businessman maybe even than a ball player. What is his philosophy on business management, on wealth, on how he handles his finances? That would be fascinating. And that market would eat that content up. That would be right up their alley. That hits the East Coast, West Coast sports fans that are husbands and fathers. What about creating content about how to be a better dad and take care of your family with a life insurance policy? Or how to set up a, uh, a, a, a college savings plan for your kids, right? So many ways to talk to that audience and show them that we know who they are. And this is what Betterment's creating. Just stuff on the market and uh, why, why there's turbulence. And, and you know, this isn't bad content and I don't mean to pick on them. This is really what everyone's doing. What they're doing is they're trying to appeal to everybody 
and in my opinion, they're kind of appealing to nobody by, doing, by trying to appeal to everybody. This should be more in line with who their market is and how they speak and think. Here's a little case study I'm gonna end on. E-File Cabinet, they're a client of ours. Love this company, amazing executive team, like they're so, so cool. Uh, E-File Cabinet, they uh, are a document management system for uh, uh, accountants and for HR and for mortgage loan officers. Uh, tons of, anyone who's dealing with tons and tons of paperwork, you can take all your papers and they will use OCR, they'll scan it in, they'll deal with your management, storage of those, uh, any compliance issues that you have with that paperwork. Fantastic solution. Um, and they're going after, like accountants is a huge industry for them. And so they came to us really for SEO. They wanted to increase traffic, increase leads from SEO, build their brand and help their salespeople talk to clients. And we made the mistake that I'm telling you guys not to make. We just thought in our gut, who's an accountant? Accountant's this guy from Parks and Rec, right? He's, he's older, he's dry, he doesn't have a sense of humor. You know, the slightest joke is just so funny to him because he's so starved for entertainment. That's kind of who we thought of. This is your stereotypical accountant. And so we started working on a campaign for the stereotypical accountant. And there's a bunch of eBooks. And frankly, they did, they did okay. We built out these logic funnels. Uh, uh, once they got delivered the eBook and, and we would nurture them and they converted and, and it was okay. But then we thought, is this really who the accountants are? And we actually met with their sales reps. We interviewed their customers and we did a bunch of other things that I've suggested today to understand that market better. And the thing that kept coming up over and over and over again is that this is who the accountant is. They're really just like us, which is funny to say, but it's true. I mean, like they're just normal people, but the paperwork is the thing that kept coming up over and over again. They hate dealing with paper, with copiers, with fax machines, the filing cabinets, all of it, they hate it. So we thought, why don't we create a place where they can take out their frustration on all the things that they hate about their job? And what we did is we created the world's first mobile rage room that we took to a huge convention for accountants. We set it up, they would get suited up with gloves and a vest, and before that they would fill out a form that was a safety waiver, and it would get them into our hub spot so we could nurture them, gather those leads. Um, we also set up a camera inside where we would film them going to town on a copier or a fax machine or a printer and then we would send them their own video so they could share it with friends and coworkers. And they loved it. They ate it up. If, you, if we had the, the, the archaic idea of who an accountant was, this wouldn't have worked. But they weren't who we thought they were. And they just destroyed these things. It was so cool. And they, they, they loved it. Um, we got a ton of press because of this, both print and uh, video. And uh, just in case you're interested, we recycled every piece of electronic that we uh, destroyed during this. This built organic traffic. We got a ton of links organically because the campaign was so cool. We got more leads because of all these people coming in and we nurtured them. We built their brand and helped their salespeople get in the door. Uh, but in my opinion, what this really did that's the most important thing, is it told thousands of accountants at this conference that we understand you. We understand what it's like to be an accountant and have to deal with all these printers and fax machines and whatnot. And we're gonna give you a chance to do something you've always wanted to do. And if we understand you this much, just imagine how much our product understands you and will solve those problems. And that's the goal of marketing. If our marketing comes off that we don't understand you, why would the consumer think that the product understands them, right? There needs to be that alignment. And so we need to work to gather data so that we can teach them that we understand them. So if you find yourself in that uh, uh, half of marketers that don't feel highly proficient in their jobs or don't feel like you know what you're doing, think about how can you gather more data to input into your, your mind so that your mind can do what it does best and crunch on that data and come up with cool ideas. Because if we can show our market that we understand them, that we're here for them, that our content is here to give them a better experience, not to serve us, then what that does is that creates raving fans for our brand. And the raving fans do most of the work for us. They'll bring fan, friends and family and coworkers to us and, th and then suddenly we don't have a lot to do as marketers because it's gonna grow on its own. But it's so much work to show those clients, those customers, that we understand them and that we care about them. 
that's been my presentation. Uh, if you ever want to talk more about content marketing, SEO, conversion rate optimization, advertising, hit me up. Uh, just reach me, LinkedIn, Paxton Gray. You can also find me at uh, paxton at 97thfloor.com. Thank you so much.